Uh, cats are lazy. They don't want to write libraries. They want to use libraries. They want to use other people's work to do the work for them. And if you're one of these people who is on a high horse, you should consider joining us plebs down yonder on the grounds in the real world. Um, we shouldn't be trying to take everybody and turn them into computer scientists. It's okay if people are just using things without knowing how they work. Because JavaScript is on every page of every user on the internet, and the vast majority of people have no idea it's there. The vast majority of people, when they see the WebKit inspector, blows their mind. They're like, oh my god, are you hacking into my computer right now? <laughs> so this is a quote from somebody who saw JavaScript for cats, decided to leave me a really nice comment. Um, what garbage. And so, in their first version, I used the word REPL. I introduced the REPL in the browser. Open up the Chrome Inspector, you get a REPL, and I, uh, I conflated it with the command line on accident. It's, I have since taken all references out, but not because of this comment. Uh, but he goes, and you spent more time waiting through the silly baby talk to get to the meat of the topic, a waste of time. So, the logical fallacy of this man or woman on the internet is that if somebody knows the difference between a REPL and a command line, they're not the audience of JavaScript for cats. <laughs> uh, they're, and they're probably not a cat. Um, and then the third thing I learned was that order matters when introducing concepts. So I picked a particular order um, in JS for cats in introducing JavaScript piece by piece. And I would love to see other orders that you, anybody out there uh, has had experience in teaching JavaScript fundamentals. So, start with strings. Um, you can't really get around them, and they're everywhere. So, what I do is I, I get into the WebKit inspector, and uh, or I'll just say Chrome DevTools. And uh, I have them make a string. So, they make some strings that are disparaging towards uh, other species. And then I make them make a string with non matching uh, quotes, and they get an error, and that's okay. And then I introduce the idea of refresh, and everything's fine, and there's no way to break your computer, web browsers are safe. Like, make errors, please, it's the way you learn. And then I go into values and have them uh, see that there's all these things hanging off of things, and I get into variables, save in a sentence you can move multiple times, how to call a function right away. Um, so there's built-in functions, and you should be able to use them. And so I have a little example of how a function call works. The third thing that I teach is function calls. And then the fourth thing I teach is, okay, so there's a bunch of functions built into the browser, sure, but, there's also a million times more out on the internet. And if you can take uh, all of the people here who have written libraries and you can learn how to use the solutions that they've already written in your browser, that's super empowering. That's the power of the internet. Network effects are awesome. So I should want to go to underscore JS because learning a new verbal polyfills, like I'm never going to say those words to a newbie. Like cats just want to get their stuff looped and make a bunch of like dog photos show up on the screen of dogs like getting. I'm not even going to say, but, so, you copy paste underscore into your inspector, and then you type an underscore, and you have this new thing, and it's like, hey, you just loaded this library called underscore, uh, you can flame more underscore all you want, but I like the API because it just adds a new thing that you get all this fancy new stuff that wasn't there before. So before you loaded underscore, underscore was nothing, and after you load underscore, you get all these uh, fun tools that are like shortcuts. It's making your life easier, allowing you to be more lazy. So I think that's a really, really super powerful concept that a lot of people don't even know you could do. Like a lot of uh, JS developers use script tags for everything, and it never dawned on me to actually just copy paste into WebKit Inspector for debug until a couple years into my JS career. But I think that um, getting comfortable with developer tools and being able to screw around with the page as it's running is really powerful. And then I want to dive into writing new functions right away. So it's like functions let you be lazy. They let you uh, do things multiple times without have to, having to do a bunch of manual work. So I have a function that just adds hella exclamation points to anything. And then, um, then I go into loops, because loops are another really important part of laziness. And so I use that underscore thing that we loaded in um, to do a loop. And I was having a really interesting discussion with Ben Allman earlier today about, is it better to teach for each, or for? Or is it better to gloss over that and just teach them a, here's an argument and a function, and based on the argument, the function is going to do different things. So in this case, the times function does 10 times that function with a different number. And is that is the thing I just said harder to describe to somebody who's never programmed before, or is it a for loop where you have to know the semicolons, and the var instant instantiation, and the, the Ikerbet operator, and like all these things. So school's out. That's why we need to figure out good teaching methods. But so far, people haven't got stuck here. Um, and then these are the
the newer sections, I decided to get into data structures. So I do some array stuff. Um, you have an array, you get the length, then you have an object, you set some keys, um, and just talk about ordering when you need ordering, or fast lookups when you need fast lookups keys. Um, but that stuff's already starting to get a little bit too abstract for me. So, observation four. Um, functions are really important. They're just so important to grasp because they're everywhere. And if you know how to use functions, you can use most JavaScript libraries and you could use a lot of, you, I mean, that's like the, the cornerstone of most of what I think JavaScript is. Um, and I, so, so observation five, you can also skip most of JavaScript when you're teaching it. Like, how awesome would it be if JavaScript's the good parts was designed for cats? Like, it's, it kind of assumes that you've been writing JavaScript since 1997 and you're like revisiting it and you uh, are trying to kind of have this renaissance, but it doesn't read well for beginners. So uh, when teaching JavaScript, I am still trying to figure out these are open questions. When do you introduce prototypes? That's such an abstract concept and kind of hard. I mean, it's nice that people that have never programmed before don't know what object-oriented is and formal inheritance, but um, like prototypes and scope specifically are really, really, really kind of difficult to not be really boring when describing. And the last thing you want to do is bore the student and make them quit. So I haven't even integrated these things because they're more, I think they're more on the spectrum side of things, they're more on the author side. Um, and closure is specific, like, no cat ever wants to know how a closure works. That's like, that's the combination of knowing scope and function, like how functions work and how scope works. And it's like, this is like, if you get closures, you get all of JavaScript, but the whole point is that you don't need to know all of JavaScript. Um, and again, like, I'm really trying to figure out at what point in the development, because I've been working with absolute beginners, and my, I myself think I know most of JavaScript, but it's that middle part, it's like the progression that I'm really interested in now. Um, and just more, like, it's really important to ignore the bad parts and make it as simple as possible and reduce um, as much as possible. So I just don't mention semicolons because you can teach somebody JavaScript without even acknowledging them. It's important when they're more progressed to mention them. But I, in my experience, it's just another thing to remember. Um, for loops, as I discussed before, I don't know if it's better to teach people for loops or not. Um, but so far, I've been ignoring them. Um, I, I think that having a build step it, for debugging and learning why your program isn't working is a really, really tricky thing for beginners. And JavaScript, if you teach it the right way, can be just as simple as, as a compile to language. So I haven't used compile to languages as a, a teaching tool yet. Um, and inheritance, um, like, as I mentioned, JavaScript, I think, is more of a functional language than an OO language. Um, so it should be taught as such. And in general, I would say, I would try to keep away from abstraction as much as, as much as possible. The programmer mind is capable of thinking abstracts, but you have to get there. It takes a long time. It takes a lot of debugging, putting log statements in, figuring out, oh, this function didn't return to this function in a 16 stack deep function call chain. Um, and until your mind is wrapped around abstract thinking, you can't just throw abstract terms at somebody because that's like, there are a lot of things in programming that have no analogy in the real world, and you have to be cognizant of that. And so uh, uh, the sixth observation is reducing cognitive load. And so here's a few examples. Um, when describing a function, you can be more specific when you're talking about like a, a method on an object. That's a function because a method is a special word. But a uh, method is so hard to get precisely right. It's, it's easier if you just always use function at the beginning and not try to teach them the difference between function and method because that's an abstract difference. And it's, uh, it's one of those tricky things where you could get in a flame war on Hacker News about is it really method or is it function or is it prototype object or whatever. So like it's, there's, there are like that tendency of like, oh my god, somebody's wrong on the internet? Like that is something you can't have when you're a teacher. Um, and so here's an example, like who, when they were learning testing uh, and knows Machina 7 was confused for at least a month about the difference between Machina 7? Show of hands. Yes, like it's, it's, it, it is like so embarrassing how long it took me to figure out the difference between Machina and Subbing, but it's because it's an abstract difference and it's hard to think when you're like already testing an interface. That itself is an abstract concept. So there's, there's these things that we take for granted after we learn them, but it's hard, it's hard to um, just ignore them when you're teaching. So does this look okay? So uh, this is a slide from a talk I did about Node in the browser and using Node patterns for client-side development. And, uh, 
on the left are HTML5 APIs that involve streaming data. So if you wanted to read a file, you have to learn all this stuff. You have to read, you have to do read as binary string, on progress, loaded, total target, and target result. If you want to make an exit chart request, there's no overlap. You have to use XML HTTP request. Why is XML there? Nobody uses XML anymore. Uh, you have to know open, response text, or response, or response that body, or whatever. Um, you have to know send and unready state change. And then, if you want to get video from your camera or audio, you have to know user media, source, web kit URL, the create object URL, set context to the drawing, which to get URL, create element, pen shop, create something. Oh my god, like nobody ever needs to know all of that stuff. That's for authors. For users, here's what Node does. Node abstracts file system operations, TCP, uh, like every piece of I.O. with on and pipe. So if you learn streams, and you know now what on and pipe are, events and streams, then you could use all of the magic complexity that authors in Node have written, but you don't have to learn all the W3C APIs. There, there are JavaScript libraries that do this stuff, but it's just as hard to discover them as it is to use them once you've found them. So reducing cognitive load is super important. And standards bodies aren't cat friendly, unfortunately. But thought experiment, what if they were? Um, cats love windows, they love looking out of them, love looking out of them. Window on word, sorry. That's just a bad joke. So um, observations six through thirty-four are actual cats that I observed in the wild, so let's look at some of them. Because there weren't enough cats in this presentation. Oh god, let's zoom in. We'll zoom in further. Can you see these cats? Oh, it's gonna be way too dark. Oh god. Well, okay, so here are a lot of cats that I've seen. Just to like get my cat quote up. Here's Isaac from the Node Project and his cat Aristotle. And uh, just tons of cats outside. Uh, I, I wanted to have more than 150 slides, so. Uh, and I have a captive audience. Here is Aristotle again. Aristotle was my favorite cat. Sorry, I just really like how gigantic that cat is. And okay, right, so. Observation 35 is um, people have different types of learning. You can't have one curriculum that fits everybody. The biggest problem with the education system in the United States is standardized testing, um, where we teach the same curriculum for everybody. So, um, you know, there are things like immersive learning, visual, procedural. Um, immersive would be you are hired at a company and they have an existing project and you start diving in. You have a real production system, you learn from out, inside out. You're, you're uh, looking at actually written code and you're figuring out how it's running. Visual would be um, learning through awesome Canvas things in the browser. Procedural would be like listening to a lecture and learning it um, step by step. And so some great ways to overcome these disparities in education style um, are things like JS Fab. So uh, let's see. So. Um, JS Fab is in Berlin, and it's JavaScript for absolute beginners. I'd recommend reading this blog post by Jan Lenart um, at Jan.io, and uh, it's, there, I mean, there are tons of things like this around the world. This is just one that I have personal experience with. They have a GitHub repo, uh, or sorry, a GitHub organization with many repos um, relating to this thing that I'm talking about. They teach it to humans, though. Um, and so, Screen. Um, so they run this thing, JavaScript for Apple Beginners. It's free, they have a lot of mentors, and it's just a bunch of people in a room doing like four hours a day for two days in a row, eight hours total. Total noobs, JavaScript, but the coolest part is you have mentors around. Um, and the important thing about mentors is you can't ever put every, every question in a book. You have to have real people. In person goes a long way, especially for people who get frustrated. If they know they have somebody with them there, it's super, super, super important. Um, and there's a link to uh, the JSFab curriculum for day one. And the coolest thing about this is that I did JS for Cats and they did this independently. And the first step for both of us was open the console. So that, that's a good thing teaching tools. Show somebody the console, open up Chrome developer tools, and go crazy. Um, and then the second thing that they did was inter in, uh, introduce how to use functions and uh, expressions and values. So this was really good for me. It reinforced that I wasn't crazy in the process, but I think that these kind of things can be refined. I would highly encourage people to fork these repos. JS for Cats and JS Fab is all on GitHub. You can fork it, try it out, teach it to somebody, make pull requests. Like, let's make this stuff better and work for a wider uh, array of different people. 
And then the other thing is, the guy who did uh, JSFab in part was Marion Heverbecki and uh, Tiffany Conroy from Berlin. And I can't say his name, sorry. Marion uh, did this book, Eloqua JavaScript, which is an introduction to programming. It's for that other end of the spectrum. Uh, and it's really good, it's open source, free online. So he has a lot of experience, and um, Open Tech Schools on Twitter. I also want to mention some other organizations doing really cool stuff. There's Black Girls Code, literally the demographic that is least represented in uh, like JavaScript or most programming language, languages. It's the same thing as Open Tech School, but specifically for young black females. And it's in the Bay Area, and they actually got a grant, and they're nationwide, and they want to expand further. Um, super, super awesome organization. Follow them on Twitter. There's also Coder Dojo in Ireland. Uh, it's kids programming. And the cool thing about it is that you have like an 11 year old kid who picks up programming really quickly, by like a month in, he's now a teacher. And he's teaching the new kids that come. Um, Coder Dojo is exploding around the world as well. Um, so there's lots of ways to get involved with this stuff. Um, and I would say that if we don't actively all try to make JavaScript more accessible to the whole spectrum, then we're not going to expand the demographic of people using JavaScript. Um, and this is a super important issue. So number 36 is that it's getting amateurized. Um, and we have to be okay with that. Uh, if people don't know how something works, they're still capable of building cool things. Um, and part of amateurization is kind of like populist uh, politics. So an example is, uh, we're at Empire.js, but I want to talk about RomanEmpire.js, which uh, it was this conference about, um, I think it was like 2170 years ago or so. Um, and it's like real history. So 133 BC, uh, Tiberius Gracchus um, got into power and he enacted a law to redistribute lands for farmers. And that was crazy because Roman people are all about aristocracy. And so um, an alternate timeline uh, here in the present, uh, track B is this guy Brendan Ike, he created a JavaScript thing to redistribute programming to all those poor browser users that could do dynamic content. Um, so back in 133 BC, uh, unfortunately, Gracchus was assassinated on 300 of his supporters. Uh, meanwhile, in 95, JavaScript was kind of just ignored or hated uh, for like 10 years. So 10 years after Gracchus was killed, um, his little brother actually, uh, Gaius Gracchus, he enacted more populist laws in a similar vein to giving money to poor farmers. Um, and similarly, 10 years, 11 years, after JavaScript was born, there was this thing, uh, John Resnick introduced this populist JavaScript framework you might have heard of, jQuery. It's like, it's pretty crazy. It like lets people use the browser uh, who hate the DOM. Um, so it like widened the audience. And uh, you're gonna hear from him in just a minute. But, um, so, so uh, Gaius, he also uh, was forced to commit suicide and thousands of his followers were also killed. Uh, Rome was a harsh place. Um, and so, two years later, uh, after jQuery, luckily, John Resnick disappears into his obscurity very happily and is not forced into any of these horrible ends that the Roman populist uh, leaders were forced into. So, um, that was the past, but I want to talk about the future of this education initiative that I'm working on. Here's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see more applied JS, the kind of um, integrated or immersive learning that I talked about. Because so far, JS with cats is kind of like, okay, meet the JavaScript language and do some stuff that reinforces your ability to think that you could be a programmer in the future, but you haven't actually built anything yet. Um, somebody told me that I should make a full screen canvas app that makes a laser dance around on the screen. So like, you would program randomly a red laser to move, and if a, so cats would be programming this because that's what JS Cats is for, and I think it would be an infinite loop where as soon as they ran the program successfully for the first time, they would just like start attacking their computer forever. So it, it's kind of a dangerous proposition, but um, I also want to do GitHub for cats because JavaScript is really important, but sharing is more important, and having a community and being able to ask questions um, and publish your code and be a maker is almost more important than knowing how to code. Um, I also want to do server-side cat grammar. Um, so, node for cats. Uh, because node's awesome because the bad parts of JavaScript are, nobody uses them, like, ever. Um, you can't find a library where people, that's popular where people use the bad parts of JS. Also, like, debugging for cats, like, how to, uh, how to ask for help. How to share your code online and go into IRC and open GitHub issues and actually, like, 
learn constructively by being able to know how to ask questions. That's a really big, uh, big question mark for me of how to teach that. And I also do a lot of data viz, and I think data viz is really fun because you get immediate results. So data viz for cats would be cool. Um, and CSS for cats um, and HTML. So if anybody wants to do any of those, do it. And uh, the, the for cats empire is uh, totally PSD licensed. <laughs> uh, so here's your homework. Find a cat or a human um, and teach it JavaScript. Thank you.